All right, so we are recording. It's a glorious day here in Chem 150 Lab, or not Lab, Land. There we go. Um, I'm Brad Neal, and we're going to talk about a couple of housekeeping things here at the top, and then we're going to continue on with our discussion of thermochemistry. So for those housekeeping things, um, we've got, let's see here. All right, I think you may have lost me on the things that you're able to see, but that's all right for right now. Um, the couple of uh, things about that course website, um, specifically uh, links to the video uh, regarding the office hours and uh, additional practice problems we did for uh, gases. Uh, slides that contain the work that uh, we did as well. Quiz 4 is online and is available. Uh, please make sure that you check out uh, your email to, or log into ACE to see the details for that. Next week we are doing an online test. So we're going to do the whole thing online. It's going to be running from April 2nd until April 4th and we're going to have pretty much the same format as our online quizzes. Excuse me, we're going to have it be open book and open notes. And for notes specifically, we're going to be saying that those are notes that you have written yourself. Um, so you can write down whatever you want. And we're going to count that as the notes that you've written yourself. Feel free to use a periodic table. Feel free to use calculator. But please don't use the Internet. Um, Next week, we're probably going to be finishing up with thermochemistry, the first, uh, the lecture anyways, first part of the week. Um, and then we'll transition into uh, the next chapter's material. Uh, you should have sent, you should have seen some emails regarding the designated tutor um, scheduling. If you have not heard from your designated tutor, please reach out to your designated tutor um, to get with them and find out um, what you can be doing uh, to schedule a meeting. I'd like to have those meetings all wrapped up by April 3rd. Um, yep, and that's what we've got in terms of the look ahead. Oh, and before I forget, we have uh, on the writing assignment uh, page, we've got uh, the new uh, dates for the writing assignment materials. Um, so it's, those have been updated in the instructions for the writing assignment itself. We also have those exact same dates down here at the bottom. So the due date for the final draft will still be the same as it was, but we've kicked out the due dates for some of the other uh, assignments. And hopefully uh, we're going to have the third draft go live so that people can start uploading that as they see fit onto ACE uh, today or this weekend. I'm just waiting to hear back um, regarding whether or not I set up the assignment on ACE properly so that folks will be able to do those two peer assignments or peer reviews using the rubric. The After the test next week, we're going to be um, back on our original quiz and test schedule. So all of the quizzes and tests that are listed in the syllabus, we're going to keep on that schedule. The reason that I want to keep on that schedule is because um, by keeping exam four on the 16th, we won't be having an exam the week before finals week. Um, so we'll have that whole week before finals week where um, you can be focusing in on um, other class material because I know you've got other classes and we can also be focusing in on uh, review material as well. Any questions about that? Okay. All righty. So without further ado then, let's talk about some concepts. And you all are not able to see that screen. All right. Can you see the uh, slides now? Yeah. Cool. Are you? You're, but you're not able to see me, are you? All right. Is that better? Can you see me and the slides? You can, but the screen is really weird, isn't it? That's cool. All right. 
I'm like fixing this stuff on air after I, I spent a bunch of time trying to fix it earlier. And it was working. That's the fun part. All right. Cool. I'm hoping that you can see the slides and you can see me and we will get going. All righty. Um, I think you just lost me again. Well, you're just not going to see me. The recording will see me though. Let's talk about some more definitions because we've practiced or we've seen um, some problems with some thermochemistry now um, in those discussions. Now we need to do some more definitions to practice some more advanced problems. And the two definitions that we're going to start with are heats of reaction and enthalpy. So the thing about the... Um, thing about thermochemistry uh, specifically specifically with chemistry is that uh, a lot of times we're measuring the change in heat for a chemical reaction now sometimes it's going to be a reaction um, something like combustion um, sometimes it's just going to be uh, a process uh, some kind of solid dissolving um, that dissolving isn't really a chemical reaction um, but something like combustion is no matter what, whether it is a uh, dissolution or it's a combustion, usually measuring heat gained or lost is pretty simple. Um, you just got to use a thermometer, and we've got all different kinds of those all over the place. Now, specifically when we're talking about a reaction, um, the heat that is involved in a chemical reaction, that Q, we're going to give it a special term, and that term is going to be called the heat of reaction. If we were doing something like dissolving a solid, that could be the heat of dissolution. But if you see heat of reaction, it's in the, it's in the term. This is specifically the heat involved in a chemical reaction. So by looking at Q for a chemical reaction, we can figure out a bunch of things regarding the physical process. Specifically, we're going to be able to determine whether uh, the reaction is what we call exothermic or endothermic. And these are probably terms that you've heard before, but we want to make sure that we've got good, uh, uniform, uniformly understood definitions for these. So an exothermic reaction is going to be a for chemistry, we're going to say this is a chemical reaction uh, in which uh, in a system um, in which energy is converted to thermal energy. So we've got some kind of reaction taking place and the chemical energy, the things that are um, like, and we talked about that, I think in lecture one, uh, such as bonds, energy stored in bonds, uh, that kind of chemical energy, it's getting converted into thermal energy heat. Now, when we've talked about our definitions for our system, um, we had isolated systems and we had open systems and we had closed systems. So for an isolated system, that exothermic reaction is going to produce a uh, change in temperature within the system. Um, we don't honestly uh, in chemistry 150 and in our course, we don't talk a lot and we don't do a lot of examples about isolated systems. Um, we will talk about open systems or closed systems though, and, or we will have more, we will have examples and problems with those in a, in an open or closed system. We're saying the heat is given off uh, to our surroundings. If heat is going off into the surroundings from the system, Q is negative. So in an exothermic reaction, specifically an open or closed system, Q is going to be negative. And if we think about an endothermic reaction, um, it's going to be kind of the opposite. So now we have thermal energy, um, and that's going to be converted into chemical energy. In an isolated system, um, again, we're not going to be talking and doing many examples with those. Uh, our endothermic reaction is going to produce a decrease in temperature of our system, but 
we will do more with open and closed systems and here the heat is absorbed from the surroundings into the system and so q for an endothermic reaction is going to be positive you're going to want to see that uh you're going to want to think about if i've got an uh, exothermic reaction i'm going to need to know that q is negative and if i have an endothermic reaction that q is going to be positive Now, what does that look like? Let's give ourselves like a, a, a sketch, a model here to discuss this a little bit better. All right. So with our, um, okay, First off, this is probably one of the world's worst drawings. So let me try to explain this. I tried my best to draw a beaker using PowerPoint, and it was fantastic. And then that little horrible squiggle thing on there, and I know it's horrible, and I apologize. That's supposed to be the uh, top part of a solution. So if you squint, maybe that looks like a beaker that's got some kind of solution in it. Yeah, I appreciate the squinting there. That was nice. I That, that uh, did help. Um, so what we're going to say for this diagram is that everything that's in that beaker is going to be our system and everything surrounding the system would be by definition, our surroundings within the beaker there. Um, we've got a couple of different lines. Um, so I don't know if you can see the mouse very well at all. Um, so what we have labeled as here is our reactants and our products. Now it's not to say that in this beaker that the reactants are up at the top and the products are at the bottom of the beaker. What we were trying to do is overlay an energy diagram inside of our system to kind of talk about what's happening to uh, the energy of our system with respect to this reaction. So over here on the left, we have our scale for this um, schema, we'll call it that. And we've got our potential energy saying that it's increasing as we go higher up. So from this example, we would say that our reactants have a higher potential energy than our products. So overall in this reaction that's happening within our beaker, we are going from a place of higher potential energy with our reactants to a place of lower potential energy in our products. Well, what's happening to the energy that the, is resultant from the change from reactants to products? Well, that change in potential energy gets transferred out of our system into our surroundings. So that's from a thermodynamics perspective, we kind of start thinking about energy levels and how, what is the energy of one side of the equation relative to the other side of the equation. So that's not the normal way that we write out chemical reactions. Um, we're used to looking at chemical reactions as something like this in class. So we've got our reactants on one side of our arrow, and we have our products on the other side of the arrow. So if we do this combustion of butane here, we see that our butane plus our oxygen goes to form CO2 and water. Great, it's a combustion reaction. And if you've ever used a butane lighter before, you know it gets hot. Okay combustion reaction releases heat. Fantastic. That also is telling us because we can feel that as part of that reaction, it's releasing heat. It's an exothermic reaction. So we would expect Q for this process to be negative. Yeah, negative. That's right. So we're used to writing out reactions like we have up here at the top. Another way we could write this reaction out, though, is what we have here at the bottom. We could write out the exact same chemical reaction, but now we can write heat as one of our products. 
because it's an exothermic reaction, we are releasing heat. If we go back to that terrible diagram, we're saying that energy is going out to the surroundings. So the heat here, by writing it on the product side, we're saying that heat is a product of this reaction. Now, one thing that we could do, and there's examples in your book, um, and we'll have some examples in the discussion packet as well, is, yeah, we can write out heat as the word heat here on the right. We could also put in the numeric value of the heat. Um, and the nice thing about putting in the numeric value of the heat is going to be, um, it's going to allow us to kind of treat heat uh, as a quantity that we can use alongside our balanced equation to figure out how much energy would be released upon the combustion of two moles of butane. So we could actually ask ourselves, okay, if we had two moles of butane, and if we knew that this was a number, let's say it's uh, 1,300 kilojoules, just making that number up, um, we would be able to say for every two moles of butane combusted or burned, we would release 1,300 kilojoules of energy. Because it's written in our balanced equation there, we now can use stoichiometry so that if we said, okay, we don't have two moles, we had four moles. Well, we know the relationship of two moles of butane is to 1,300 kilojoules of heat. We can set ourselves up a nice little stoichiometry dimensional analysis problem and we can figure out exactly how much energy is going to be released upon the combustion of however much butane we truly have. Now let's switch gears. So we have another crummy diagram, um, but this time uh, the difference is we have reactants here at a lower energy level and we have products at a higher energy level. So now for this reaction to be taking place, we have to get enough energy into the system so that we can actually form these products because the products uh, are at a higher energy level. So this would be an example of the change in energy for an endothermic reaction. So energy is going from our surroundings here on the right into our system here on the left in order to have the reaction go from reactants up to products. Now you might imagine that sometimes for these reactions, um, that energy barrier, or I'm sorry, that, that distance in energy, it's not an energy barrier, that distance in energy, that change between reactants, the products might be so high that you have to dump a ton of energy into it in order for the reaction to go from reactants to products. And that's absolutely true. Um, many industrial reactions that are vitally important require large amounts of energy to be dumped into them. Um, so you'll do that to... Um, actually form products. So here would be an example where Q is going to be positive. Um, you've probably, if you've ever done any kind of sports um, or have ever been injured, um, you know that putting an ice pack on your muscle group that's damaged or whatnot can help it feel better. Um, but if you were out in the middle of a, I don't know, a soccer field way away from an ice machine, um, getting a bag of ice to put on your injury might not be practical. But you may have experienced instant cold packs. So something like an instant cold pack might be filled with ammonium nitrate, um, which is just a, you know, it's a, it's a salt, it's a form of a salt. Um, while the ammonium nitrate itself isn't actually undergoing a reaction, um, so it's not necessarily going from reactants to products as we've got this scheme drawn, it is still an endothermic reaction. So it's taking, in the case of a, a cold pack, we are taking that salt, and when we snap the ice pack, we are breaking the barrier between the salt and the water or fluid that's in the uh, pouch we're allowing the two to mix. That mixing is an endothermic process. So it starts, so in order for the uh, 
process to go forward, it's going to draw heat from the surroundings. Well, in the case of an ice pack, you are the surroundings as soon as you put the ice pack on you. So you start feeling cold because it's drawing energy out of you and it's putting it into the system, namely the process that's going on. So uh, even if you never thought that you truly were part of a thermodynamic process, hey, if you've ever put an ice pack on you, you have been. Um, whether it be a chemical ice pack or whether it just be regular old ice. So if we were going to write out a chemical uh, equation for this kind of process, would we want to put heat as a product or would we want to put heat as a reactant? Here, heat's going to be a reactant. Yeah, because then we need the heat in order to drive the reaction forward. So we're going to, heat is acting as a reactant. It's necessary for us to have product formation. Yep. So if you see heat uh, and energy being explicitly written there on the left side of an equation, you know right off the bat, hey, this is an endothermic process because of where the heat is being written out in a chemical reaction. Okay, so the enthalpy, or I'm sorry, the uh, heat of reaction is the straightforward concept that we're going to go over today. Um, what we are going to be discussing next is not as straightforward. Um, so it's going to require some math and some derivations, but at the end, uh, we'll show you the punchline of all of this discussion and why it should be important to you. So luckily for us in Chemistry 150, most of the chemical reactions that we're going to uh, work with are going to exist under constant pressure. So we do them uh, out on the bench top and they're done in a styrofoam cup or uh, they're done in a beaker that doesn't have a lid. Um, and so because it doesn't have a lid, even if the reaction does produce pressure, it, the pressure of the reaction uh, gets to go, oops, gets to get pushed out against the uh, external pressure. They equalize quickly. We consider it a constant pressure system. Your book, and I would suggest that you read through it, your book talks about constant volume systems. Um, constant volume systems are going to be set up a little bit differently than the constant pressure systems that we're about to discuss. And I'm not going to tell you that you won't have one constant volume question on your next exam. So this, I guess, will be my little way of you know, like checking to see how many people are watching the video. Um, so this is my like indication to you that you're more than likely going to have a constant volume calorimetry question on exam. We're going to talk about calorimetry in a little bit more detail here in a minute. I know I just dropped that term. Right now, we're going to talk about the impact of doing most of our reactions under constant pressure. So, we've talked about the internal energy of a system, E or U, and we've talked about ways of determining E or U. So, uh, the change in internal energy anyways, with respect to uh, Q and W. So what happens if we're going to do reactions under constant pressure? Does that relationship of what internal energy is uh, change? Does it become more difficult? Does it become uh, easier to understand? So we're trying to now kind of think through, okay, we're doing our reactions at constant pressure. What is internal energy uh, going to do about that? And this is where we're going to drop uh, one of the more complicated terms uh, for chemistry 150. And it's complicated because it's very abstract. Um, so enthalpy is a thermodynamic term that we are going to define as the sum of internal energy and the pressure volume product of a system. So enthalpy here has a mathematical definition. So it's the sum of our internal energy and it 
the so we're going to take the internal energy and we're going to add it to whatever the product of our pressure volume is for the system that we're measuring so written out enthalpy is going to get the symbol capital h internal energy is going to be u or e depending on the book that you're reading and pressure times volume so enthalpy has this very mathematical uh, basis, and it's going to be useful for us. Uh, it's going to allow us to understand uh, thermodynamic processes a lot better. So that's a math definition. What does this like mean in the real world? Um, so in a physical sense, um, the internal energy is all the energy uh, of our system. We can think of it being defined kind of here as creating our system from nothingness. So if we think about a void, it has nothing in it, and then poof, our system appears. That would be the internal energy component of enthalpy. Well, if we have that internal energy component um, for creation of this system into our void, we're probably also going to have a pressure volume component for pushing anything that might be in our void out of the way as part of the creation of the system. So the pressure volume component is uh, the energy necessary to push aside anything that is in our surroundings out of the way for our system to exist. So um, you might think about this if you watched any old school, um, it's kind of weird to say it, but old school Star Trek The Next Generation when they had the um, replicators. And so, you know, you got Earl Grey, hot, and which I guess was only really said four times in the series according to a YouTube video I was watching. Right, I was surprised too. Um, Thank you for making me work from home because YouTube is definitely not a thing. Um, so when someone went to the replicator and they requested their food, the food materialized out of nothingness, right? But it wasn't like the food just was like, oh, hey, it's here. Well, what was the energy change necessary to create that food? Well, you had, or tea, whatever it was. One, you had to materialize it out of nothingness. Two, you have to push whatever had been in that, the place that the, whatever's being replicated, you had to push it out of the way. Because it wasn't like the atoms of air in the replicator got replaced by atoms of Earl Grey tea. They, they had to move. Um, so enthalpy and Star Trek The Next Generation go hand in hand. Actually, a lot of, this is kind of the point in time where if you do watch Star Trek, you're going to get a lot of the references that we're going to be talking about because this chapter and the next chapter have a lot of Star Trek in them. And if you're like, oh, good, I hate Star Trek. Like, well, I don't know. Fast forward through the video. It's probably a bad idea. Okay, if you're like 99.99% uh, .99 of the population, you're asking yourselves right now, how does this relationship of enthalpy actually help us? Um, and that's a perfectly valid question. And here's where the math comes into play. Because remember, you asked, how is this helping us? All right, stretch. Let's make sure that we're good with this. Here we go. So, we defined the change in internal energy of a system as being equal to Q plus W, so heat plus pressure volume work. Work, right, we said was equal to negative P times delta V. Now, specifically here, we are making this the constant pressure form of work right? Because we put P, but we're saying that we're changing the volume. So volume can change, but pressure is not going to change. But that's fine because this whole thing that we're setting up right now ha is a reaction that's happening at constant pressure. 
So pressure, we're not changing. There's no delta in front of it. So if we only consider PV work for a constant pressure reaction, we can do some mathematical substitutions. So if we get delta U is equal to Q. Now we put the subscript P there, and we put that P to denote that this is specifically heat at constant pressure because we are at a con we're doing this process under constant pressure. So it's important to just kind of help ourselves denote that. We're now replacing the work with that negative P times delta V because volume can change. It's just pressure that isn't. Cool. So now, uh, since we can measure the change in volume and we can measure heat transfer, we can figure out what the change in internal energy is indirectly, which if you watch the discussion, discussion section one live on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell, um, you are going to be able to determine what that internal energy is. How does that relate to enthalpy, though? All right. There's our equation. If we do a little bit of rearrangement, now we're just putting the Q on the left-hand side of the equation. So uh, we can think about just taking that uh, negative P times delta V and moving it over to the left-hand side and then just putting the Q just rearranging those two sides. So mathematically, that is fine. So now we've got heat. So now let's consider our change in enthalpy. Before we talked about enthalpy, now let's talk about the change in enthalpy. So change in enthalpy for a constant pressure process is going to be delta H, change in enthalpy, equals change in U, change in internal energy, plus P, P does not have that delta in front of it because we are keeping pressure constant, times delta V, because volume can change. So, I don't know about you, but that change in enthalpy equation looks an awful lot like the heat equation right above it. I think they look pretty similar. In fact, this leads us to the understanding that our change in enthalpy and in a constant pressure process is going to equal the energy in the form of heat that we measure for that constant pressure process. So we really don't have to keep track of a change in volume. That's a punchline here. If we want to know the internal energy change, or I'm sorry, the change in enthalpy for a constant pressure process, we just need to keep track of the heat. And that's pretty nice because um, that tells us a lot about that enthalpy equation. Uh, tells us a lot about that whole coming into nothingness and moving any particles around. For constant pressure, it doesn't matter. We just have to keep track of our heat. So our heat of reaction, remember if we're doing a reaction, that Q would be enthalpy of reaction or heat of reaction. The change, went ahead and gave away one of the punchlines here, uh, that heat of reaction and the change in enthalpy are interchangeable terms for a constant pressure process. Oops, I'm going to go back. Um, and so you've heard me slip up and say it a few times, the enthalpy of reaction, that is the same thing as saying the heat of reaction for a constant pressure process because enthalpy and the, the change in enthalpy and the heat are interchangeable mathematically. So we can say for a constant pressure process. And I know that I keep saying constant pressure process and you are just so tired of me saying that, but it is important because it, this delta H equals Q doesn't work for constant volume. And that's why I'm saying it 
again, please check out constant volume calorimetry in your book because you're going to have a question over it. Delta H does not equal Q if volume is held constant. It doesn't equal Q. But if pressure is constant, then it does. Enthalpy of reaction is the same thing as the heat of reaction. Same thing as the change in enthalpy for a process at constant pressure. Boy, it's so much fun to do math on PowerPoint slides, isn't it? But the nice thing is I tried to color code it for you. Well, I thought it was nice. So there you go. Follow the uh, color coding and you'll be okay. I hope. Okay. So we're going to... This is going to, I think, be the last slide that we're going to cover um, because this is, uh, then we're going to kick it over to calorimetry. And so we're going to just put a pin in that until Monday. And I think Monday might be the last uh, topics lecture for class. Just stay tuned. So strictly speaking, a change in enthalpy, delta H, is going to be equal to the enthalpy of our products minus the enthalpy of our reactants. When that's the same kind of definition we used for change in volume, right? Volume final minus volume initial. Products are the final and reactants are the initial. So again, we have final minus initial equals change in whatever the change was. Let's think about delta H and what it can tell us with respect to endothermic and exothermic processes. So if our enthalpy of our products is greater than the enthalpy of our reactants, we could say that Q should end up being a positive value. And if Q is a positive value, heat's being absorbed by the system. If heat's being absorbed by our system, we have an endothermic process. So we can take a look at delta H and we could determine, hey, is this an endothermic process or is this an exothermic process? Just by looking at the positive or negative sign here on the enthalpy of change, or the uh, yeah, change in enthalpy. If we go the other way and we say that the products have a lower enthalpy than the reactants did, then we're losing heat to uh, the surroundings from the system. So we end up with an exothermic process. Um, and a heat pack is uh, a nice representation of this. So for a generic heat pack, we might have uh, iron solid, like iron filings of some sort, um, and we might have oxygen. Um, this is these are uh, this is like one form of a heat pack. Um, so iron plus oxygen going to form uh, iron three oxide. Now we have this delta H written out over to the right hand side. That delta H is a negative sixteen fifty two kilojoules because it's negative. Do you have an endothermic or an exothermic process? Exothermic, yeah. So we are going from our system into the surroundings. So we could put that negative 1652 kilojoules in line as one of our products. That's 100% viable. Okay. So a question that could be uh, green pepper level of spicy question could be how much heat is being released when four moles of iron is reacted with excess oxygen so oops so we can think through it or we can write through it i'm going to try to write through it here real quick if the there we go all right okay so if, and for some reason, you all at home are not seeing this, so I'm going to change that up for everybody real quick at home, watching live. Okay, hopefully you can see the white page over on the left-hand side now, everybody at home. 
and I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna move this so that we can see more of the question. Okay, so there's our question. Now let's write it. Let's try to answer this. So we've got four, oops, let's not write in highlighter. That'd be kind of pain. We've got four moles of iron from the way that the problem is uh, written out. From our balanced equation, we saw that for every four moles of iron that get reacted, we release 1652 kilojoules of energy in the form of heat. Our moles of iron cancel. And we're left now with, if we just do the math in our head, one, negative 1,652 kilojoules of energy released. Now this problem is incredibly basic um, because I'm literally asking you if you have four moles of iron and if you look at our stoichiometry, we're saying it takes four moles of iron for this process to occur. A way to add any kind of flavor to this whatsoever would be changing that four moles of iron in the problem to any other number, um, 52 moles of iron to make it a more college appropriate level. We could say 52 grams of iron. If we say 52 grams of iron and we have the reaction that's written up above my head, um, let's see, am I going to be able to hit it? Oh, almost. Yeah, yeah. So if we had the 52, I'm not going to be able to hit that. Yep. My hand disappears. That was fun for me for a second. Um, if we have 52 grams of iron, all we have to do then is convert the grams of iron into moles of iron. Whatever moles of iron we had goes right here and we can kick out exactly how much energy is going to be released. Okay, I'm going to go to the next question. All right. Sorry, folks at home. There you go. Hopefully you can see the board and me and the question. How much heat is released when one mole of iron oxide is produced? Good news is this works just like the problem before it. Now we just get to go in and we say, okay, we have one mole iron, three oxide. We look at our balanced equation and we say, all right, for every two moles of iron three oxide we release 1,652 kilojoules of energy now I said we release that much energy so I don't have to put a negative we're not going to say I release a negative amount of energy and if I say release the negative is then implied and take a look at our units, units cancel. And so then we end up with, uh, this is where I wish I could do basic math. Be really good for me. One, sh -sh 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 -sh. wheel, crumb. This is embarrassing. I'm sorry. 826. 826, wow, man, I was off. Yep, this is why I do chemistry and not math. Make sure you share that clip with all the math instructors. Actually, everybody you ever known. That'd be really good for me. Please don't. So, easy breezy lemon squeezy. The problem is set up the same way. It just might read a little bit differently. Any questions about that? Okay. 
Um, let me make sure. Yep. Yeah. And then the next thing that we're going to cover, not today. So the next lecture is going to be calorimetry, and we might end up finishing out uh, the rest of the topics of thermochemistry on Monday. Uh, by Tuesday, for sure, thermochemistry chapter is going to be completely done. Um, that means Wednesday we'll be doing um, we'll be doing more practice problems or any questions that you have in discussion. Um, one thing that if I can try to get it up here for everybody, oops, not that. Um, under, um, let me get, okay. So on the support site, if you go under chapter objectives, there are for the various chapters, there are suggested problems from the end of the chapter. So for everybody who says, you know what, the homework is cool, but I want more. They say the discussion packet was cool, but I want more. For you who wants like the triple dip in terms of problems, here's the triple dip. Here's a bunch of questions that are listed on here on the support site from your book that it, if you can do these, I can't stop you. There's nothing left for me to, I mean, there's, I can ask you questions, but if you, if these aren't tripping you up, then you're, you should be set. All right. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Seeing none, um, please make sure you finish the quiz. That'd be really good for everybody's grades and for my sanity. Please reach out if you have any questions. Um, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, I already made the like, subscribe, and hit the bell joke, but hey, why not do it again? Because um, I've got uh, one subscriber to the YouTube channel. It's very exciting. All right. I hope that everybody has a good day, and uh, I'll see you next week. Or email me or call me at that phone number that's been posted up on the support side a ton. Or text. I can do texting too, I think. Pretty sure. That's all I got. If you want to bail, totally understand.